Okay, so today the wise old owl will be talking about talking about multidimensional evidence-based practice, and uh, this will be a short, uh, semi-short um, uh, presentation. But there's two topics, so uh, <clears throat> you'll see a pause in the middle of it. So. Um, I subtitle this um, presentation a verb, not a noun, and um, uh, and it kind of gets at um, <clears throat> multi-dimensional evidence-based practice as a process of discovery of best practice versus uh, uh, a freestanding best practice in and of itself. And, and actually, um, uh, in Petter's presentation of best practice, um, anybody who claims that they have a, in quotes, best practice, um, unless they're referring to a localized uh, implementation of something, they're probably stretching it a little bit uh, because uh, an element of Petter's best practices investigation uh, includes the the adaptation to the local environment. So, <clears throat> the qualitative principles that we've been studying this year in Ruben and Babby. Um, uh, talking about in this class are very uh, compatible with and adaptable uh, to uh, Petter's uh, uh, MEBP uh, process. Um, <clears throat> discovering a best practice for a particular context is the goal of multidimensional evidence-based practice. This discovery process is continual and is strongly supported by qualitative research pr principles. Qualitative research is much more flexible than experimental or quasi-experimental designs. In fact, um, multidimensional evidence-based practices can and probably should be thought of as a case study design. Um, in, in this case, uh, the case that is being studied is the practice context. <clears throat> As a case study, it will be uh, similar to other practice context. However, since the context is unique, the likelihood of a unique best practice for your context is itself likely. <clears throat> so again, let's let's take a quick look at the steps of of. Uh, of uh, multi-dimensional evidence-based practice. First of all, we identify the question, identify the sources of knowledge, uh, multi-dimensional sources of knowledge, summarize the findings across these knowledge perspectives, assess the potency of these findings, and then use value criteria to critique and improve upon current best practices. The qualitative methods are flexible. Um, oftentimes they're nonlinear and and they're usually reflexive. Uh, <clears throat> deciding that the study has gone down the wrong path is not uncommon in qualitative studies. Therefore, the entire process is always up for review. For example, when we conduct our literature review in qualitative methods, we take it as as a time to review our research question. It is our question, we ask ourselves, is our question still valid in light of what the literature says? Has my question already been answered? Uh, the same is true uh, for each step in, in the qualitative process and each step here in, in the um, uh, best practices investigation. Uh, so let's look at these sources. Now, here in 5536, and we did this for practical reasons, uh, we have taken the sources of knowledge out of Petter's suggested order. <clears throat> and the order that Petter suggests is 
in my opinion, probably better than what we're doing here in this class. Uh, <clears throat> but because most of y'all don't have access to consumers initially when we start uh, uh, the course, uh, trying to get the consumer's perspective first uh, may be problematic. So, uh, um, similarly, getting the professional's perspective might be difficult uh, if, say, you only have access to a single um, uh, practitioner in your field instructor. Uh, so it takes a certain amount of time to, to, to build these liaisons and these uh, relationships. That's, that's why we started with a research perspective, even though Petter puts it last. So, um, so when we think about doing a literature review, it'd be easy to do that and then determine, you know, what the current state of the art is in a practice area, and then just stop there. Say, so, okay, we'll just implement it here. Uh, <clears throat> but um, current accepted best practices are really a starting point, not an ending point, of your. Uh, best practices investigation. And whatever the literature says is the best practice is simply one source of multidimensional knowledge. So it's important to remember. Uh, <clears throat> now just like when we do a literature review and we kind of reflexively look back at um, our, our um, research question, we should also think about doing that as we go through the process uh, with each uh, knowledge source. Um, and we can do that in several ways. We can do it uh, um, after each individual interview, decide, you know, am I still on the right path? Um, uh, <clears throat> so after we re reviewed the literature, reevaluated our research question, um, uh, we uh, are ready to ask those questions of professionals uh, with practice wisdom. And when we talk to them, we're ready to look back at the literature and go, did I look at the right literature here? Um, uh, is there some holes or gaps in my literature? And we can still then just look all the way back to our question. Maybe I'm still, you know, not studying the right thing. Uh, so, armed with all this knowledge of the context, the literature, uh, we can conduct interviews that go beneath the surface of political correctness, uh, and the, as I like to call it, the tyranny of we've always done it that way here, uh, which goes on a lot in organizations. And, um, um, and our reaction to Developing knowledge shouldn't only be thought of as something that we we look backwards with, that we look back at our, our previous steps and decide if we're still on the right path. But it's it's also something that we can use to to look forward and to move forward as we go into our next rounds of interviews, or if we need to go back to the literature to to, to do that. So um, so now the consumer's perspective. We had a separate section on doing literature reviews, so I'm not going to go over that. Um, uh, <clears throat> and the professional perspective, um, um, it's different. Um, the consumer has often been left out of the discussion when it comes to uh, treatment that is in their best interest. So. Um, the more that we can come up with multiple sources of consumers' perspective, the better we are. So, of course, you know, what multiple perspectives are we talking about? Of course, there is the consumer herself or himself or themselves. Maybe it's, you know, it's a, it's a group of people are your consumers. Um, they're a natural consumer. But then again, there are also advocacy organizations. Um, um, for just about any condition that you are treating, so if you're treating, if you're, if you're um, working with people with mental illness, particularly severe and persistent mental illness, you're you're going to want to see what the National Alliance of Mentally Ill has said about this. If you're working with um, um, children in foster care. Uh, 
court-appointed special advocacy groups uh, or court-appointed special advocates uh, would be a good uh, would be would be a good source. Uh, similarly, in foster care, uh, uh, non uh, um, you know identified problem family members um, uh, might be. Uh, um, a source, you know, grandparents of children who have been removed, aunts, uncles, those sorts of things, siblings, perhaps, uh, and then even the parents sometimes, uh, who even though they may, they may, um, um, uh, you know, may have been had their children removed for for just reasons, uh, they also want to work to get their uh, children back in many cases, and so they have a stake in it. So these are all different consumer sources. Uh, websites, you know, generally, you know, when we talk about doing literature reviews, I, I give you the big um, hex sign on on uh, on websites and say don't go there. <clears throat> uh, but when it comes to getting a consumer's perspective, that general rule uh, sometimes you can you can violate uh, because sometimes uh, uh, people with different kinds of disorders will self-publish their. Uh, their experiences, their needs, their wants, their opinions uh, on websites, and uh, sometimes they're, they're, they are their own websites, and sometimes they will be on the websites of some of these advocacy organizations, or just you know in, in Google groups or something like that, where people go for for uh, self support around a, a certain condition, uh, and then sometimes even even. Um, uh, the consumer perspective will um, be the subject of uh, a research study. So, so uh, you know, you have to be careful when you look at um, research. You know, you have to evaluate the, it as a research article. And you know, is, is this you know yet another another way that that um, um, The academy or we as professionals kind of subjugate the the consumer voice. You know, uh, it's um, it's very possible to get a a whole bunch when you're in a power position. You get a whole bunch of people to who agree, agree with your general position to uh, uh, say what you want to say, and then you're the you're the person who uh, um, organizes all this information. So. Um, there's um, there is a um, uh, a place for that. But also, you know, just like any other piece of literature, you need to carefully evaluate it for quality. The next step in our multi-dimensional evidence-based practice process. Uh, after we've collected these uh, findings and we've analyzed them, we've looked for commonalities. Um, um, we um, then uh, need to uh, decide, you know, how good are our findings? You know, uh, did did we did we get the quality of of sources that is necessary for us to? Really make a determination about what is best practice, you know, and and again we've talked about the quality of literature, how it varies from source to source. Um, um, you, you know, we, we we tend to think of of, of uh, experimental and quasi experimental designs as being a, of a little bit higher quality sometimes than um, qualitative studies, um, but not necessarily. There may be there may be uh, uh, deep embedded value in a well done qualitative study that we would never see in a quantitative study. So uh, we have to judge each source for its quality and its contribution. So uh, when we get the professional opinion, again, we 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 just don't take any um, uh, any professional and. Uh, you know, say, oh, okay, well, you're a social worker, so you ought to do. <laughs> uh, they'll have a variety of professional experiences, trainings, etc., licensures in some case, or certifications. Uh, 
which may, or in some cases, may not add value to your investigation. You know, the most brilliant social worker uh, uh, who have trainings and accolades in child welfare, you know, they might not just add much at all to your best practice investigation in adult mental health or oncology social work, even though, you know, many of them will have had children who, who have had mental health problems or, or have been involved with the mental health system, and they're going to know about it kind of one step removed in the case of mental health, and then, you know, even further uh, to adult mental health. So they may not, they may not add to your investigation at, uh, at all. Um, so that's important to think about. Now, consumer perspective, that, that gets kind of a, you know, um, a, a very subjective world out there because, uh, uh, you know, how do we assess a con uh, consumer? You know, you know, we don't get, you know, they don't get certified, certified. You know, we don't, we don't have licensed consumers. We don't, we don't uh, have any of those kind of things. And, and um, um, uh, then on the other hand, we don't want to fall into the trap of thinking just because someone has uh, experienced a condition that, that they are the all and know all about what is necessary to remediate it. You know, even somebody who has um, overcome a problem may not have a real clear idea of, of, of what it is that, that made that happen. And uh, um, uh, if they haven't spent a lot of time reflecting on how they overcome that particular problem, then um, uh, you know, they, they may not, what they have to tell you may not be of great uh, use to you. Um, and it's real important that, that we, um, We make sure that, that people have expe expertise in the area that you're actually studying. And sometimes this can be, be uh, kind of tricksy. So while a member of, say, Alcoholics Anonymous, who has significant amount of sobriety, might be a great person to have advising you on your best practices for a substance abuse treatment, um, they might have little value for a primary substance abuse prevention program. And, and I mean, I, I've, I've seen this happen. You know, years ago, my stepdaughter came home from um, junior junior high. It was junior high, and said, "Oh, well, I saw so and so." You know, it was a friend of the family who was a member of AA, and uh, um, uh, oh, really? What were they doing? Oh, they were there to do the um, uh, uh, do a talk on um, on uh, substance abuse prevention. It's like prevention. You know, well, what does this person know about prevention? You know, they nearly, they nearly drank themselves to death and drank themselves out of house and home. You know, they know recovery well, well because they've had a significant amount of sobriety. But you know, they, they, they don't have, they don't have a personal, and they, and this person did not have a professional uh, background in substance abuse prevention. You know, they, they had, they, they had one line, and so, so. Uh, you, you, you might not get what you bargained for in that kind of a situation where the, the only thing the children might hear is, oh, okay, so you spend your, you spend your, um, you know, early life partying and then, um, uh, you know, when you get tired of drinking, you go to AA. <laughs> I know, that's kind of cynical and oversimplifying, but it, it wasn't a good fit. So, value criteria. And again, uh, we think about, you know, overall professional values, um, you know, is, is, is the, uh, is the uh, program efficient? You know, do we get our, do, you know, I mean, is it worth paying for? Is it effective? Does it even work? Those are, those are some basic values um, that, you know, we pretty much all hold. You know, we don't, um, um, uh, most of us, you know, take a little bit of time to think about, you know, what kind of, of um, car we're buying to make sure it's efficient and effective, or, you know, uh, a new appliance for the home, uh, is it efficient, is it effective? Uh, you just don't buy anything. Uh, we should do the same thing when it comes to um, uh, uh, interventions that we're looking at, or interventions that we're thinking of adopting. Um, when you look at these interventions, um, does it support clients' strengths and, and choice? You know, strengths is, is um, uh, and uh, client self-determination 
our kind of core social work values. Self-determination is so core, it's encoded in our code of ethics. So um, uh, we have to ask these questions about these programs. Uh, you know, I, I could, you know, develop a, a very effective drunk driver recidivist program, uh, you know, just lock people up forever. They'll never, they'll never drunk drive again. Um, and uh, uh, it's not very efficient, uh, it's effective, not very efficient. Um, and it doesn't provide assistance in the, in the least restrictive way. Now, well, there's a, there's a whole ball of wax for you. you know, if we look back at the history of least restrictive treatment, it really has its roots in, in deinstitutionalization of people with chronic mental illness. And, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, that, that was back in the days when, when folks were, were shackled in state hospitals. Um, uh, they, they, they weren't getting treatment for the most part, uh, and they were highly restricted. Uh, their, their movements were highly controlled. Who they associated with was controlled. Uh, uh, what they ate was controlled. When they went to sleep was controlled. Uh, and to some extent, when they got their exercise and even went to the bathroom, uh, had, a, had a level of, of being controlled. Uh, so um, uh, <clears throat> as the um, um, deinstitutionalization movement moved forward and people started coming out of, out of hospitals, um, living in their own uh, apartments and, and other living situations um, uh, with the assistance of medications usually, uh, uh, case managers quite often. Um, <clears throat> uh, they found it a, a, a new freedom. So, so, but you know, both of those things, um, you know, having a case ma manager poking around in your life, uh, perhaps to a less extent, but um, um, uh, taking some medicines can sometimes be a, a restriction in your life. Uh, you know, so, you know uh, taking some of the psychotropic medicines have pretty serious side effects. And, um, um, and some people, and I've met those people who, who would have gladly traded the, the lack of side effects and the kind of sense of security and safety that they remembered from their state hospital days for the constant anxiety and, and, and uh, um, uh, struggle that they felt to try and you know, maintain themselves in, in their own apartment. So, so which is really the least restrictive? You know, and in one way, one is, is physically more restrictive uh, uh, but perhaps in the other one, is, it, it's uh, living in, in one's own apartment could be uh, restricting a person in, in, in other ways that have less to do with mobility, but more to do with, with um, uh, perhaps more internal things that may, may or may, may be more important to, to some people. So it's, it's, a, it's a question we have to struggle with and not just kind of get on the, 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 the latest bandwagon of, of, oh, we need to get people in their apartments, or, oh, we need to get people jobs, or some of these kind of things that kind of have rolled through the mental health movement. And, 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 and for the majority of the people who are in the center of the bell curve, you know, those, those are good ideas, but there's always those extremes that we need to take care of them as well, too. <clears throat> now we have to always ask yourself this value, is the cost to society, society acceptable? You know, is it acceptable to to lock people away because they have a mental illness um, um, and they're they're not a danger to others. Um, is it acceptable to to pay for that? Uh, you know, not only just taking away their 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 liberties, but you know, do, you know, do we as a society say we need to pay for that? Um, um, you know, we've um, you know we used to to kind of have a, a blank check when it comes to um, um, people doing their um, uh, Therapy ongoing, you know, if they were on they're on disability at Medicare, Medicaid, you know, pretty much therapy for life if if, if they had a therapist willing to see them. Uh, uh, but managed care companies, um, at the behest of, of the people paying the bill, said, you know, we really need to look at this. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we need to have treatments that are medically justified or or um, behaviorally, you know, justified from a behavioral health perspective. Um, 
So, um, uh, you know, society isn't, isn't going to write a blank check for just anything we do. And, um, um, and if you're, you're, you're uh, designing a program that is based around uh, self-pay, uh, you know, is the cost to your customers acceptable? Because, you know, you can have the best program in the world, but if nobody was willing to pay the price, uh, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, so those kind of things need to be evaluated. And all of these values, again, are subjective. One, one person's too high a cost uh, fiscally is another person's bargain fiscally. And, uh, um, you know, one person who, 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 th who thinks that it's okay to, to lock up a person with a mental illness um, in a state hospital uh, because uh, they don't like seeing them around, they feel uncomfortable, brings down the, 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 the value of the home prices in the neighborhood, those sorts of things, um, will be balanced by somebody who, who, who um, believes that that individual's uh, freedom uh, is, is more important than, than uh, all of these economic costs. Um, so, so uh, and we have to judge all that stuff and value that stuff when we're, when we're developing programs and, uh, uh, and deciding what is a best practice. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop this uh, slide with this slide and then I'll have a follow-up uh, presentation uh, about um, um, bringing together the multiple perspectives um, of consumer, practitioner, and literature. So thank you very much.